We've seen that we can think of elementary steps of organic reaction mechanisms as involving overlap between filled and empty localized molecular orbitals. Because the numbers and types of localized molecular orbitals are limited, the number of possible elementary steps, or electron flows, is limited. In this series of videos, we're really going to drill down into the nuts and bolts of mechanisms and look at the 10 most common types of electron flow in organic reaction mechanisms, the 10 so-called elementary steps of polar organic reaction mechanisms. Here, polar refers to the fact that we're moving two electrons at a time. And although we could envision this framework as involving the three possible filled types of orbitals overlapping with the three possible types of empty orbitals, the 10 common elementary steps are organized slightly differently. So we're going to start by looking at the 10 steps in broad brush, brush strokes as an overview and then survey the individual steps throughout the rest of this lesson. Let's begin with an introduction and an overview of the elementary steps. There are 10 elementary steps that are common to polar organic reaction mechanisms. We describe each of these using curved arrows to show how electrons reorganize themselves during the steps and use a unique localized molecular orbital interaction between a filled and empty localized molecular orbital, like a sigma MO, pi MO, non-bonding orbital, empty atomic orbital, pi star, or sigma star antibonds. And importantly, as we've seen, curved arrows imply the localized molecular orbitals involved. In other words, if you're given the curved arrows, you can infer the localized molecular orbitals involved, and vice versa. The table shown here lays out the nine possibilities for filled orbitals shown here in the pink columns overlapping with, with empty orbitals shown in the blue rows. And going through this table will really help us firm up this connection between localized molecular orbital overlap and the curved arrows involved. When a non-bonding lone pair overlaps with an empty atomic orbital, for example, electron flow always starts at a lone pair and terminates at an atom with only six total electrons around it. In fact, in all three of the examples on this row, we see that same building block appearing, the six electron building block. Since an empty atomic orbital is involved as the acceptor, the electron acceptor, in all three cases. These differ in the nature of the source electrons, with a lone pair serving as the source in this first case, a pi bond serving as the source in this case, and a sigma bond serving as the source in this case. We've seen previously that a pi antibond involves electron donation to an atom involved in a double or triple bond, followed by breaking the double bond and sending those electrons to generally the more electronegative atom in the pair. An N to pi star interaction always starts at a non-bonding lone pair. In fact, that's identical to the case above, which makes sense because we're in the non-bonding lone pair column, and involves cleavage of a pi bond, and this is where the pi star acceptor comes into play. We see that pi star acceptor appearing in the other two examples in this row as well. In the pi to pi star case, a pi bond serves as the source and a pi antibond as the electron sink. And in the sigma to pi star case, a sigma bond serves as the electron source, and again, the pi star antibond serves as an electron sink. When a sigma antibond serves as an acceptor, the case is analogous with a sigma bond breaking rather than a pi bond. Here again, we see the non-bonding lone pair acting as a source in the non-bonding lone pair column. And in the other two examples, all we're changing up is the nature of the electron source, with pi electrons serving as the electron source in the second case, and sigma electrons serving as electron source in the third case. These nine types of electron flow are all the possible types of electron flow that you'll see in reaction mechanisms. However, some are more common than others because the different types of electrons and empty orbitals have different stabilities and different reactivities. So we've seen, for example, that non-bonding lone pairs and empty atomic orbitals tend to be the most reactive filled and empty orbitals, respectively. This means that we should expect N to A type electron flow, such as we see in this cell of the table, to be relatively common, since the orbitals involved tend to be highly reactive. On the other hand, sigma bonds tend to be much less reactive, so pretty much everything in this third column tends to be relatively rare, as sigma bonds don't often serve as electron sources. The beauty of the framework, though, is that it shows us all of the possibilities and helps us see that where we're going to live generally in terms of electron flow are these areas where we have relatively reactive orbitals involved, such as non-bonding lone pairs, empty atomic orbitals, and in some cases, pi bonds. On this slide, we're going to list the 10 common elementary steps. But before we do that, we need to define a couple of terms. 
When a bond breaks heterolytically, meaning both electrons of the bond go to one of the two atoms involved in that bond, the atoms involved in the bond end up with different fates. X is going to increase in formal charge since it's losing electrons, while Y is going to decrease in formal charge because it's gaining electrons. And it helps to give terms to describe X and Y in this case where the bond breaks heterolytically towards Y. In this situation, the group Y is called the nucleofuge. It's called a nucleofuge because it's departing with a pair of electrons. It's becoming a nucleophile in that sense, since if XY begins neutral, the result of this electron flow is X plus and Y minus, and so Y has been transformed into a nucleophile due to cleavage of the bond. The group that ends up with no electrons after a bond breaks heterolytically, which in this case is X, which becomes X plus, is referred to as the electrofuge, because it becomes an electrophile after heterolytic cleavage of the bond. You'll see these terms crop up in the names of the elementary steps, so it's important to understand what they mean. The first elementary step, and arguably the simplest, and one we've actually looked at in detail already, is proton transfer, which always involves an n to sigma star interaction. The second is dissociation of a nucleofuge, which involves the cleavage of a sigma bond toward an atom which is the nucleofuge. And this involves kind of a strange sigma to A interaction that we'll look at in detail in the corresponding video for this step. Association of a nucleophile is the exact reverse of DN or dissociation of a nucleofuge, and it involves an N to A interaction, one of the most common and important elementary steps, as we saw in the last slide. Dissociation of an electrofuge, or D sub E, is another type of sigma to A interaction where the focus now is on the electrofuge rather than the nucleofuge, and the reason we focus on the electrofuge will become clear when we talk about that step specifically in a later video. We then have association of an electrophile to a pi bond, which is a pi to A type interaction or electron flow, 1, 2 rearrangement, or 1, 2 R, which is sigma to A, nucleophilic addition to a pi bond, AD sub N, which is always an N to pi star type interaction, beta elimination, which is always an N to sigma star type interaction occurring intramolecularly within a molecule, bimolecular elimination, which involves a sigma to sigma star interaction as well as an N to sigma star proton transfer type interaction, which we'll see in more detail on that step's video. And then finally, bimolecular nucleophilic substitution, or SN2, which always involves an N to sigma star interaction. And it differs from proton transfer in that it doesn't have to involve a proton. It involves the transfer of a heavy atom or group, where proton transfer involves the transfer of a proton. One thing that's worth pointing out now that we have all 10 steps in front of us is which steps are the reverses of the others. Some of these steps are their own reverses. Proton transfer is an example. Proton transfer and SN2 are both their own reverses since that step running in reverse is also a proton transfer. We mentioned earlier that DN and AN are reverses of each other, as suggested by their names. DE and AE are also reverses of each other. And one that's important that I didn't mention is nucleophilic addition to a polarized pi bond and beta elimination are reverses of each other. And this will become especially important in your second semester of organic chemistry because nucleophilic addition to carbonyl compounds and its corresponding reverse, beta elimination of alkoxides, are two very important elementary steps in a carbonyl chemistry context. Proton transfer, SN2, and 1,2R are all their own reverses in the sense that that step running in reverse is that same type of step. The reverse of bimolecular elimination is actually a step that we're not going to discuss because it's relatively rare for reasons that will become clear when we discuss E2 in detail.